Happy politics and welcome to yet another edition of your favorite BC Politics podcast. I know it's mine, it's probably yours. This is BC Poly Hot Stove. My name is McLean Kay. I am the editor-in-chief of The Orca. And in a socially distant manner, I am joined once again by... Jordan Bateman, VP Communications, ICBA. Do we, do we still have to say socially distant manner? Uh, you know, I'm going to do it right up until there's a time when we don't have to do a socially distant matter. All right. I did uh, scan McLean's vax card. I can assure you he is double vaxxed. That's true. I am double vaxxed. Um, huh. Well, I was going to try and find a nice way to bridge from double vaxxed and inoculating. And uh, really, I just want to talk about this cruise ship story to start because we can't seem to, you know, inoculate ourselves against protectionism from the States. That probably was it right there. That's... Uh, it's Tuesday morning. Give me a break. Um, <laughs> the Vancouver Sun published a op-ed this morning from, and I had to look this up, Congressman Don Young, a 25th term <laughs> Republican congressman 50? from Alaska. Years. 25 terms. Um, basically, the gist of it is, if you haven't read it, I suggest you do. Uh, but the gist of it is, is that um, they want to make permanent the ability for cruise ships to skip B.C., on the route uh, to Alaska from Washington State, California, places like that. In other words, it's exactly what people were saying might happen last year, or earlier this year, I should say, when the Americans were uh, proposing making this a temporary measure because, of course, the cruise ships could not stop in Canada. Um, what I mean, this is something we said would happen, Jordan. This is something that the Americans would notice, hey, they don't actually have to stop in Canada for any reason whatsoever from their point of view. So why wouldn't we allow cruise ships to do whatever the hell they want and spend all that money in Alaska rather than Victoria or Vancouver? Well, exactly. This was entirely predictable, especially given the current culture uh, in the States of um, US isolationism. Uh, mm -hmm. Protectionism, certainly, um, this should have been known. Um, the BC government ignored calls from the cruise industry just to chat about it. Uh, ignored a letter from the Alaska delegation saying, hey, we don't really do this, but this is kind of where this is headed. Um, bungled the file completely. We, we all recall Melanie Mark standing up in the House under the withering questioning of the BC Liberal opposition, saying, we are arrogant in our confidence that this will never see the light of day. John Horgan, oh, Joe Biden would never sign such a crazy law into effect. And of course he did. This is a potentially a... Uh, well, over the long term, billion dollar boondoggle mistake, error, screw up by the uh, BC NDP government. They'll shift the blame on Ottawa. Sure, Ottawa has some blame. But look, you think the, you think the Parti Quebecois wouldn't have stood up for Quebec on something like this? You don't think, uh, you know, Jason Kenney wouldn't have stood up for Alberta on something like this? Of course they would have. Um, but, you know, BC just kind of let it go let it pass like a cruise ship passing port um, it, it's <laughs> See, terrible that's a better have run. unbelievably negative effect on tourism um you know like these guys just would not understand the seriousness of this issue now we have a tw like first of all 25 terms that's 50 years this this congressman was in congress while john horgan who's not a young guy anymore sorry john uh was still in high school this guy was doing sure. politics this guy's forgotten more politics than uh, you know John Horgan will ever know uh, most of us will ever know 50 25 election wins will do that for you <laughs> um, we need to take this very seriously we should be raising mm -hmm. the alarm we should be making peace with the Alaskans instead John Horgan's poked them in the eye as many times as possible after ignoring them for the first critical part of this file yeah, I mean, we can. We were having some fun with the twenty-five terms, which I mean, it's a remarkable number. But I mean, there's a there's a moment in the original. I'm not sure we're allowed to talk about this yet because it stars someone we're not supposed to talk about anymore. But in the original run of, um, uh, I almost said Game of Thrones, um, House of Cards, uh, Kevin Spacey's character stares down somebody who's trying to do away with him, and and Spacey's basic uh, his character basically says, "Did you think it was all a firm handshake? I know what I'm doing here." Don Young has won 25 elections, and he if you thought that somebody like him wasn't going to seize an opportunity to be seen putting America first, just, what were you, of course this was always going to happen. I, I mean, when this issue first reared its head a, a few months ago, I got some messages from people in the NDP um, privately, you know, they were just saying, you know, hey, you know, we think this is overblown, um, take 
take notice like this is there's a sunset clause here it's temporary this even if it happens and it probably won't it's just temporary and my response then was the same as it is now i mean income taxes were temporary <laughs> the, do you think the americans are just going to say oh, okay well, that money that was going to get funneled into alaskan ports we're happy to share that again with our good neighbors the canadians it's just, just that's just not how things work and if i, I would suggest that if, if this was reversed somehow and it was canada contemplating well maybe our ships don't need to go to the u.s of course we would say the same thing it's not unique to the united states so the idea that people would just continue playing nice and that they, they would allow the cruise ships to you know, not skip Vancouver and Vancouver, uh, Victoria, if they were so inclined, it was, it was always naive. And, uh, well, we can still hope that cooler heads prevail, but I, I never thought they did from, they would from day one. Yeah. This was like a, I think it was a hundred year old policy basically to try to encourage yeah. shipbuilding in the States by, but never really contemplated the rise of cruise tourism. Um, and instead of just, you know, going along to get along like we should have done and figured out a way to make this happen. Yeah, keep it going. Uh, no, no, uh, John Horgan ignored it. Then when he finally got around to it, it was too late. I know that Melanie Mark isn't on the file anymore. Rob Fleming, the transportation minister is. I look forward to hearing his comments today. I'm sure the media are uh, uh, efforting to get him on uh, <laughs> on various shows. But look, this is, a, this is bad, you know, and I, it, I think this Alaska, bill will pass Congress, uh, will certainly pass the House, it'll go to the Senate. The Senate has no reason to overturn it. Why would they? Who's going to stand up for Canada in the Senate, uh, the U.S. Senate? No one. And then it's going to go end up on uh, President Biden's desk, and that's a no-brainer to sign. Like, his pen's going to break, he's going to sign that thing so fast. So, yeah. way to go, NDP. You just, you know, put our uh, cruise industry in dire jeopardy. I would like to point this out, too. We, you know, some of us like to think that it's very Canadian to think that everyone on earth wants to come here and visit us and it's a natural <laughs> tourism destination. Um, the problem is lots of people come to British Columbia for the rugged scenery. They can get plenty yeah. of that in Alaska. They come for the ocean front, they get plenty of that in Alaska. Um, okay, maybe they want to get off at a modern port like Victoria or Vancouver. I'd say, you know, downtown Vancouver, downtown Victoria, not looking at spiffiest these days. Uh, that's a separate set of issues, so that's not really a huge desire. And the number one thing is Americans can now cruise from Seattle to Alaska and back, or LA to Alaska and back, without stopping here, which means no passports. And that opens That's it right. up to a whole new group of American travelers who have never been able to go on a cruise before because they had to stay within the United States because they didn't, for whatever reason, want to or see the purpose of getting a passport. Um, a, real, a, a, Canadian, you know, a real passport, a travel passport, not a VAX passport. VAX passports are also real, but whatever. Um, problematic on a whole bunch of fronts. This will hurt tourism. Um, we've all been in, not all, but many of us who live in Lower Mainland have been in downtown Vancouver when the cruise ship is emptied off and people come in. We've seen the Disney cruise ships in the, uh, in the harbor. Um, that is a big economic generator and that is in dire jeopardy. It is indeed. Uh, I want to talk about another thing that uh, reared its head this week and might have put other things in dire jeopardy. I'm referring, of course, to Jody Wilson-Raybould's book, the former justice minister, former attorney general, and now former liberal MP. Um, yeah. Now, it's just come out now with a week left in the election, and I, I don't think it's widely available yet, but the book contains, from the reviews at least, some pretty explosive allegations. Um, nothing that's really brand new. It was more sort of a behind the scenes of all well, the stories we were familiar with in the SNC-Lavalin controversy. Um, it's, I mean, it, it, this won't shock you if you've been following this, that it does not paint the prime minister in a particularly favorable light. Uh, some of the quotes I read today were her telling him that she wishes she'd never met him. Uh, she wanted, he wanted her to lie. Um, again, this is all things that were reported at the time, but to sort of read it in her voice is probably even more damaging. Jordan, I'm kind of surprised that the publishers didn't try and rush this book uh, a few weeks earlier. Uh, obviously, there was going to be intense interest during a, a federal election, which is, what, a week from yesterday. It's kind of surprising that they held it this long. Yeah, I actually think they moved it up to get into the election campaign because I think it was supposed to come out in November. Uh, my understanding yeah. is uh, your local bookstores, Monroe's, Amazon, Indigo, they'll all have it tomorrow. Um, I've got a copy pre-ordered, McLean. Um, <laughs> this book is the latest in a series of about a million paper cuts to the Prime Minister's image. This is the same Prime Minister when all this was reported by Robert Fife from the Globe and Mail, which 
he badmouthed again just as recently as this morning in the Globe and Mail. Um, Robert Fife reported this. He said it was a lie. Uh, it was you know false a uh, false story. Uh, it turns out he was the one lying. Uh, it you know forced the re resignation of prominent uh, uh, federal liberal backroom guys. So um, you know this was a very obvious, very obvious problem. And the and the problem for the prime minister is. No one believes him on this except the most ardent of partisans. And everyone else is just kind of like lined up behind uh, JWR. They see her as being the more credible person. She's the one who lost uh, everything in this uh, exchange. Uh, she's the aggrieved party. Jane Philpott, who's another very, uh, someone who carries a lot, to, a sense of a great integrity and credibility, sides with JWR. So you go, okay, like other than the hardest of hardcore liberal partisans, I don't know how you can take the prime minister at his word on this. Seems to me that uh, you know Jody Wilson-Raybould is telling the truth, and uh, you know it's just another little piece of damage to Mr. Sunnyways, Mr. Feminist, Mr. It's you know 2015. Uh, man, that personality, that uh, little um, you know brand, sure seems uh, sure seems old, tired, and withered by now. Yeah, I mean, there's, as I was saying off the top, the, the book doesn't really, I haven't read it yet, obviously, a few people have, but from the reviews I've read, there doesn't appear to be much that either is new or we wouldn't have sort of guessed at. It's very much sort of, well, here's the dialogue. We can actually sort of, we knew this event happened, here's the scene with the dialogue, if, if that makes sense. I don't want to present it as a scene because I'm not, I don't want to allege she's making anything up. Nothing could be further from the truth, but... Uh, that to me seems like it's the biggest part of the appeal. We know that there was incredible tension between her and Justin Trudeau over the SNC Lavalin affair. We know that you know she was essentially forced into a different portfolio, and we know she was incredibly unhappy. But it, I think, it will be quite something to sort of you know hear how that actually played out. You know what was actually said in which meeting and when. And so you're right. It's it's going to be uh, it's going to be a dart. And uh, I like your your term paper cut. The prime minister's credibility and his sunny ways. Um, I mean, we can use this as a bridge into the next topic. I mean, this we shouldn't forget. This is happening in during an election which was not in any way, shape, or form necessary. It was called because the liberals thought they saw a path to a majority government. That is looking more and more and more unlikely. Um, at this point, if that does happen and we have been thrown into a federal election and either there's no gain or that maybe you know it's possible we could have a conservative minority government and they would actually lose power, what is going to happen to Justin Trudeau? Well, hopefully they turf him out. Look, Sunny Ways is dead. That is the headline here. Like, you know, he has gone absolutely negative. Yesterday might have been his worst day on the campaign. It was here in British Columbia. He looked fidgety. He looked angry. He got into a fight with um, Anitu Garcha from uh, yeah. Global BC, where he not only mansplains to her at the end, which she really should have been asking for, you know, as a journalist, as a female journalist of color, mind you, you really should have been talking about climate change. Um, he spinsplained her as well. Like, is, is, pick one, man. <laughs> like, don't do both. Like. You know, she had the good decency not to reach over and smack him across the face, um, which, you know, many Canadians watching that video clip probably wanted to do. Terrible day on the campaign. He looked mad. Yeah. He looked wild eyed. He looked like a guy who was going to lose and or, you know, knew his fate is on the line here. Um, that is not a great look for a, a prime minister at any time. Yeah. Um, it just feels like we've come so far from the sunny, optimistic, bright-eyed, lead from the heart outward, you know, kind of pretty stuff that happened only six years ago. <laughs> like, you yeah. know, this isn't I, like ancient history. This isn't the 1970s. Clip, uh, this is six years ago. I should have mentioned the, the Nitu Garcha clip because it is, it's remarkable. And she handles herself, uh, I will just use the word perfectly, uh, because she did. And if you're Justin Trudeau or someone advising him, I mean, there's a way to do what he was trying to do without coming across as, you know, mansplaining and condescending. He could have said, you know, when she said, this is our last question, he would, oh my goodness, that went by so quickly. And, you know, we talked about some important things, but my, it would be great to be able to also talk about all the other stuff that he wants to get his his word out on. I think he mentioned climate change and, and a few other things. You know, a way to say everything we talked about is important, but I wish we could also talk about these things. That I don't think anyone would have objected to that, including including Global News. Um, but instead, what happened is he has the worst kind of clip for a politician, in which he is, you know, everyone sending it around and saying this is 
he's acting like a bit of a jerk here. And again, you're quite right to uh, to be mansplaining to a, a female journalist is not a good look in 2021 no. because it's 2021. Yes, because indeed it's 2021. That whole BC TV, sorry, Global BC, I'm old school, Global BC uh, <laughs> interaction was so weird. Like the pictures beforehand of him talking to another reporter out front of the building, they're both in masks. He goes inside, does the interview with neither, they're, neither of them are wearing masks, like stuff like that sort of makes you go, what is happening on this you know, weird campaign? Today he was in Richmond, Steveston, um, where he, uh, you know, wanted to BC drop that he had, uh, you know, as a child, uh, spent time having fish and chips at Steveston. Congratulations, <laughs> most of us have. That's fantastic. You're just like me, I guess. I don't know. Uh, we're, how, how quickly can I get to an advanced poll to vote for you, sir? You, you had fish and chips at Steveston. I hate that. That kind of is like the lamest part of politics. Yeah. The hilarious Jagmeet thing. Singh hates chips. Yes. <laughs> Jagmeet Singh's never had fish and chips at Steveston. Has <laughs> he even been here? Um, he had uh, Andrew Weaver there to introduce him. Um, Andrew, <laughs> there's like five candidates behind. They're all masked. Justin's unmasked uh, talking. Andrew, the closest person to Trudeau, unmasked. <laughs> like, it's just like stuff like you're like, uh, what's happening here? And, you know, you're like, is Andrew Weaver really the person you want putting you over? Like, uh, I don't really get it. Um, just, I don't understand what that campaign is doing. It, it seems like now they're, the conservatives and the liberals are in a complete dead heat. The latest poll this morning was 32-32. Every other poll has it in the margin of error, one way or the other, either for conservatives or liberals. Um, we are going to see fascinating street fights in various ridings, especially Ontario. No one really knows how vote splits are going to work, how it's going to come out. And as long as Singh doesn't collapse here over the weekend, which so far so good, uh, or over this week, you know, I, I, you can see. I just don't see how the liberals gain seats. If the Liberals lose seats based on one man's desire for an election, uh, one in his you know little inner circle saying this was the time to go to get a majority. Yeah, during a pandemic. Seats, during a pandemic, how the heck does he hold on to that caucus? I don't think he does. Yeah, I, I I have to agree. I mean, certainly if they if they don't form government, that it has to be curtains. There'd be no that would be a fireable offense. Um, but if they come back with essentially status quo, that's when things get really interesting because he can say, "Well, we were reelected. We have a mandate." Da 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 da. da. Well, yeah, yeah kind of. <laughs> See, a lot will depend. <laughs> I guess. A lot will depend, depend McLean, on who wins and gets into that caucus and yes. what they heard on the doorsteps during the campaign. It's Christy Clarkitis, right? You know, yeah. and Ben Chin has worked for Christy Clark, will know this movie, and is probably already terrified that he's going to have to relive it in the PMO. Um, if 50 of those candidates stand up or start talking to each other, 50 new MPs, and say, man, I barely won, and it's because at every doorstep, they sure hate Trudeau. Yeah. You know, it's different than... 2015, where every single person in that caucus owed their political life to Trudeau. Now he's a drag on them. And that's how quick it yeah. can happen. Ask Christy Clark. It can ha turn that quickly. Four years for her, seven, six for, for Justin Trudeau. Even if he's, you know, status quo, they'll all start looking elsewhere. The, the, one, the one great thing about liberals is they um, are very transactional in their desire yes. for power. <laughs> so, you know, you did it for us, bud, a couple times, but. You misread the room there. Out you go. We'll bring on the next guy. Yeah, and if you don't think people like Christia Freeland or Mark Carney aren't quietly making calls even now, then, mm -hmm. well, you haven't been around politics very long. <laughs> certainly not around federal liberal politics. I, no. I, I, would, I would say I don't, I don't feel like Aaron O'Toole is closing the deal here. Um, no. You know, I don't think either candidate has been particularly good. They both have gotten... They're both tired of each other, Trudeau and O'Toole. They're going at each other hammering tongs. That's to be expected. Um, you know, but O'Toole being just newer, we're not, things that I think aren't tired of the act yet. And yeah. there's something inauthentic about Trudeau's, uh, you know, behavior in this campaign where it, it's like, okay, so are you this guy? Cold, calculating, you know, a little bit panicky now, but wants, you know, wanting power? Or were you the guy, you know, that you've been presenting to, you, to us, like, just wanting to make, you know, Canada a better place? Um, those don't fit, so there's that kind of falseness to it. I do want to talk about um, Jagmeet Singh. Sure. And um, look, I'm no, I'm no NDP -er. Uh I can't imagine any scenario in any universe where I, uh, there's a Jordan Bateman who would vote for an NDP candidate like this. <laughs> but you know, I want to credit 
Greg Meat on running a campaign that was true to who he is. Um, yes. I'm not sure it's translating over to the rest of the party. It certainly isn't in Quebec for them, which you know they need if they're going to have any hopes of hitting 40 seats. Um, they're at seven points now in Quebec. Like they've just fallen off a cliff. Um, they're basically tied with the PPC in Quebec, which is terrible. Um, but um, you know, I can tell you, I, you know, my daughter is 18 years old. This is her first federal election. I haven't asked her who she's voting for. I don't need to. I know she's going to vote for Jagmeet Singh. I know that he's reached out to her generation in a way that other candidates have not. And you know, I want to give credit to that. Like the more we can bring uh, young people into the process, even when they don't vote like me at the very beginning, they will eventually. Wait till they actually <laughs> own something, then they'll end up voting like me. Um, you know, it, it's a good thing. So you know, kudos to him and his campaign. Uh, I do feel like their campaign has been the most authentic to who the leader was. And uh, you know, I want to tip my hat to that. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't argue with any of that. The trick, of course, when you appeal to the youth vote is getting them to actually turn up and vote, which is, sure. I mean, we keep being told that is changing, but it hasn't yet. And I hope it does, like you. I have, I sincerely believe that one day we'll figure this out, but we're not there yet. And if it's this election, that's great news. But I mean, there's nothing out there that suggests that's happening. Um, yeah, we'll see. The other, I mean, if we're going to talk about the national party leaders, we should also talk about Annemie Paul, uh, who said something really remarkable this week, which was um, she's not, She one of the reasons she hasn't toured is she's not always sure she's welcome um, in, by some of her candidates, which, you know, is I mean, you can't imagine Justin Trudeau saying that in a million years, even if it's true. You can't imagine Aaron O'Toole or Jagmeet saying, saying that. But for Annemie Paul to essentially admit that, I mean, I'm just going to go ahead and say it, in places like Sydney, the local candidate, don't want her there. Mm -hmm. <sighs> what a soap opera. Well, look, um, the Green Party uh, internally spent the year trying to kill each other instead of spending yes. the year prepping a new leader for the national stage. And you know what? You may not like Annemie Paul, but she was your leader, and your job was to get her ready to sell to yep. Canadians. And instead, you dragged her into countless idiotic procedural backroom things over the excruciating minutia of Green Party constitutions instead of getting her ready. And you know what? If she'd gotten ready, if you'd found proper advisors to put around her, you know, raise a bit of money and had a professional thing, the candidates would have welcomed her, number one. And number two, even if they hadn't, she would have been sophisticated enough and experienced enough in her leadership not to point that out. So, um, look, the Green Party is no one to blame but themselves. Um, you talk about a leader who's walking, you know, you know she's on the Green Mile now. <laughs> she's, uh, she's, it's uh, just a matter of time. They're going to hand her a blindfold and a cigarette at the end of this thing, and, and that's the end of the Green Party as, as we know it. I don't even think, uh, I don't think any of the candidates, like, I, I'm not even betting on Elizabeth May to hold her seat, and I know she's personally popular, blah, blah, blah. I think there's a lot of folks who are just tired of the Green Party circus. And um, in an election where every seat's gonna count, why would you give one to, to Elizabeth May? Uh, I have talked to some people in the Green Party, and, and I mean, they all kind of say the same thing. They're, they're just embarrassed. They're, they're so, like, they can't believe this happened. Well, they can, but it's just, you're right. It's such a shame uh, from well, yeah. their point of view. It's terrible. And uh, yeah, you're right. I, they could, there's easy, there is definitely a scenario in a week from now where we're talking about, you know, the Green Party's been shut out, and even if the PPC doesn't get any seats, if they get, you know, tripled of a national vote share, at what point do we stop talking about the Greens as a federal, as a as a major federal political party? Yeah, look, um, on your other little show, your uh, Capital Direct that you do with uh, <laughs> with Robert Shaw, um, you know, you have Jillian Oliver on the panel, yeah. and you know, uh, Green Strategist Extraordinaire, as her tagline goes. <laughs> I point out three seats is hardly an extraordinarily extraordinary result, but maybe it is given the way the Greens. Uh, you know, behind the scenes start to kill each other all the time. Um, but, you know, you can just see anytime, you know, Rob brings up the federal election or Annemie Paul, you can just almost see Jillian like, oh, like, like reasonable Green Party stalwart, um, someone who should be involved in campaigns, just like, you know, ducking and covering and wish this would all go away. And uh, I've got uh, breaking news. It will go away uh, starting Tuesday morning. <laughs> well, let's see. That'll be, uh, yeah, the next week, I guess, is going to be the all-federal election show. Um, we haven't even touched on provincial politics yet. I want to briefly talk about yesterday's 
uh, big news. Well, there was two items of big news, but we're going to talk first about BC's finances. Um, first of all, you should read Rob Shaw's piece in the Orca. Uh, he sums it up nicely. Look, the deficit is better than most of us feared, but as Rob points out, it's because of things that BC either cannot or will not uh Effect uh, and it's you know no lockdowns. Well, BC can affect that, but that's a Dr. Henry decision. It's Ottawa making it rain on a truly epic and almost biblical scale, and um, yeah, yeah, real estate, <laughs> lots and lots of money coming in from things like property transfer well, taxes, and so but, yes, but wait, it's wait, great. Wait, is that deficit. because is, is it real? Is it real estate because housing prices have dropped, and so the market like there's all these young people, new people coming into the market. Is that why? <laughs> Oh, yeah, no. no, no, that did not happen. That did mm. not happen. The market oh, is still nuclear hot, oh. um, which is terrible if you're wanting to buy a home. Uh, and it's great if you're trying to balance a budget, as the NDP have discovered. Uh, now, of course, they haven't balanced the budget yet, but the deficit's half of what many thought it might be. Uh, it, it, I, I don't even have much commentary here other than, you know, again, I will say this. I've said this many times on the show. Everything's more complicated in government. Well, I have seen some commentary around um, why is she always so pessimistic in her anything? Like she is, like it's one thing to have better than expected. She's yeah. grossly missing targets, which is fine because right now she's missing them because she's very pessimistic on stuff. But it does kind of make you wonder, like, is Ministry of Finance really, do they really have their, you know, does she really have her finger on the pulse as to what is going on in British Columbia? Uh, and, and more importantly, you know, what government and public health policies are going to look like? Or is that kind of siloed, and so she's sort of operating in the dark? There's something weird there, like to miss yeah. by billions the, in one quarter. The 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 political cynic in me suggests that you know a year ago or whatever, um, the a decision was made. Okay, now is the time to be absolutely the darkest possible pessimistic, because at the time, mm -hmm. British Columbians did not care. It was, let's just get the, spend whatever, I don't care. Let's just, I want to be alive at the end of this. I want my loved ones to be alive at the end of this. So just, they said, okay, the deficit's going to be $70 billion. I'm making up a number. And then no matter what, it probably won't be that bad. So it'll be, well, we're, you know, things are much better than we feared. Things are great. Or it was, well, we told you this was going to happen. And we did it for these reasons. And so really the only downside would have been, you know, underestimating the deficit. So I think that, you know, a year ago, it made sense to say the sky, well, not the sky is falling, but we're spending absolutely everything so that a, like, a day like today would come and we'd say, oh, it's actually not that bad. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I understand the politics of that. I, I just think that you got to start getting closer to these targets, right? <laughs> like. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. One, one other factor is, you know, clearly they have not, they made, they announced a bunch of money for pandemic relief policies. Yes for businesses of individuals. Those have been undersubscribed. They would claim it's because the economy's all hunky-dory, but really it's because they made the turn south so narrow to get into those programs and so difficult, and frankly, we didn't promote them very well. Like, uh, I, they were getting grief for a credit to spark hiring from last fall. Honestly, McLean, I do not remember that credit ever being discussed. I don't remember seeing anything about it. I you know, Googled it, and sure enough, there's a website, but I, I, no idea that that was even a thing. Um, and if I, a pretty avid political watcher, uh, missed it, uh, how do you expect the average small yeah. business to ever see it? So, um, yeah, they were, they were pretty pessimistic. I just love the irony over and over of um, successive NDP finance ministers like Carol James and Selena Robinson and, and Horgan as well, who badmouth housing costs, prices, say they want to do more to bring down housing prices and then just like Scrooge McDuck into the money bin of housing taxes, property transfer tax. Oh, they're swimming in it. They're spitting it. Like they cannot love those property transfer taxes more. And that's, you know, a great disincentive for them to ever really monkey with the uh, housing system in a way that would, you know, change that kind of revenue they get. Um, every premier of this province since 1980, since 1991 should uh, be forced to send thank you cards to Bill Vanderzam for bringing in the stupid property transfer tax because every single one of them has made a fortune off of it um, and had lots of money um, to spend on a tax that, remember, speaking of temporary taxes, was brought in as a high income earners tax, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, supposed to be only be on luxury property, but now applies to virtually everything bought and sold in British Columbia. 
And the danger politically is that, because you're right, I mean, it does bring in a ton of revenue, um, as even the NDP are conceding right now. And there is a certain segment of this province, uh, most of whom vote NDP, that thinks that the solution to housing is the same as the solution to everything, and that's to just to tax the hell out of it. Mm -hmm. And so I can envision the NDP saying, okay, well, we're going to double, we're going to triple the property transfer tax. And that's going to fix housing. It will in no way fix housing. Mm -hmm. But they will think of all the money we'll, we'll, we'll generate. And also, you know, it'll cool down the market. It won't cool down the market. But it's the kind of thing that I think they can sell to just enough people to sound plausible, even though it will in no way accomplish what it will be purported to do. I, I, I hope cooler heads prevail, but that does sound like the kind of thing that, could, that we could be discussing in four years. Yeah, look, the BC Green Party actually proposed this in, they think, their 20. 17 platform like massive jumps in uh, things and it was one of the reasons why i was uh you know happy to see that even though he had the balance of power andrew weaver didn't seem terribly interested in instituting any kind of fiscal policy for the province of british columbia during the uh green dp heyday um we should um we're going to skip right past the uh mandatory vaccinations for healthcare workers quite frankly i think most people would be shocked to know that there that wasn't already mandatory so <laughs> with your blessing we'll just zoom right yeah. past that announcement that's not mad like yeah it's bananas to me that people don't get vaccinated it's doubly bananas to me that yeah. a healthcare worker wouldn't get vaccinated and all it does is it gives rise to the conspiracy theorists that maybe things aren't as bad as they say because you yeah. know so and so is a nurse who may have never been anywhere near a COVID patient, but you know they didn't get. Yeah, it just seems to me like take your shot, protect yourself for God's sake. Like yeah, no kidding. Like I, I just do not understand, and I, I imagine it is. We talk about a tiny percentage of British Columbians who haven't been vaccinated at all. Was it twenty percent or so? Less than that, fifty mm -hmm. percent. Uh, I got to figure it's less than one percent of healthcare workers, right? I, I I mean again I'm just astonished that it's a thing I, I mean the health they're taking the most the broadest possible definition of healthcare workers which includes you know contract cleaners things like that people working in uh, the kitchens of long-term care facilities so I mean you can start to see how that number might grow but again oh my god have you, have you used your passport yet by the way do I have it? yes I have it but have you used I, it? Oh, I, haven't, I haven't used it no I have not okay. used it so uh, we did, uh, went to a, a local restaurant and uh, very nice hostess scanned it, no problems there. I've actually uh, put it on my watch as a watch, Apple watch face so I can oh, find it easily. I know I'm brilliant and it's better than wearing a t-shirt like that guy who for some reason got a bunch of press. Um, anyways, uh, I will say this, they scanned it, let me in, but they didn't actually check to see that my name matched like the ID. But whatever, it's uh, early days and God bless yeah. them, um, you know they were doing what they were told so yeah i mean it's that they, they haven't been trained yet on exactly what to do in, in situations like that so we'll see i um yeah uh, i hope that all works out um the last thing we should talk about this week is the same thing we talk about every week because it is crucial and that is the bc liberal leadership race and also because jordan you're in a very well connected guy you know what's happening before it's public and while it's happening behind the scenes um now, granted, with the federal election, I suspect everything's a little cooler than usual the last week, but has there anything that's caught your eye or that we should keep our eye on? Well, Ellis Ross sent out an email yesterday that made me chuckle because he announced that he is opening his campaign super center. Literally, <laughs> that's what it's called, the campaign, Ellis Ross campaign super center. And all I have to do is promise to show up and they'll send me the address. So, of course, I put my email in. I, you know, I was saying, well, maybe if it's down the street from me in Langley, I'll show up, but... It's not, it's, it's I think on Broadway in Vancouver. Uh, but Campaign Super Center, it's like a regular campaign center, but it wears a cape at night and fights crime because it's super. <laughs> um, I, I just found that kind of language hilarious. Um, I don't really understand what would make it super, but whatever. Um, here's the funny thing. I bet you he'll open that Campaign Super Center and I will bet you a, a six pack of your favorite craft beer, if you like, that Gavin Dew will show up at the opening of the Ellis Ross yeah. Super Center. With a six pack of craft brew. <laughs> you don't have to bet me, you don't have to bet me. It's just the kind of thing that Gavin does. So he, I, I bet yeah. you he shows up there and he and Ellis have a little bit of a mutual admiration society going. And guess what? They both want second place votes. So um, watch for that. The other thing is I can tell you that, uh, what is it, Tuesday, Thursday night, I am having uh, dinner uh, and we'll be hearing the uh, 
presumed front runner, presumptive front runner, uh, Kevin Falcon speak. Um, so looking forward to hearing, uh, you know, he's just come off a summer tour. What does he sense from that? What's he learned? Um, where does he think BC Liberal members are at and the state of his campaign? So I should have more to update on the uh, Falcon file next week. Excellent. Next week, if that's if we can talk about anything other than the federal election next week. Is the federal election day actually Tuesday or is it Monday? Monday. I, I should know this just it off the top Monday of my head. Monday the 20th. Get out and vote Monday the 20th. But McLean, yeah. um, what's your sense? Uh, should we do a quick seat prediction here? Conservative? Let's, lib? Yeah, I, I don't have like numbers, but I, I do think that I think we're looking at something that looks very much like status quo mm. with a reduction in seats for the liberals and more seats for the conservatives. But um, I, I could even see a conservative plurality of seats, but I I don't know on, that put it on the, line. What the is NDP it? can bring themselves to prop up a conservative minority government. Come on, put, put it on the line. Libs plus what over seat in seats over the conservatives? Plus two, plus oh. five over them? What are they at now? What's the current? Is that plus 25 or something like that? Yeah, I want to say 25. I think the Liberals will have a net loss of, I want to say, 15 seats. Mm, so plus 10 over the Conservatives. Yeah. Okay. I will say... See, here's the problem. So I called my good friend Hamish Marshall last week, and like mm -hmm. Hamish is the Eeyore of uh, Conservative numbers. <laughs> And so he gets me all terrified that everything's going to hell in a handbasket. And, uh, but then I look at the Ontario numbers from uh, Echo, so I'm like, well, maybe, maybe. So I will say conservative plus one. One extra, well, one, there seat, you go. one seat over the Liberals, just because I think that would create the most chaos. And if I've learned anything it, from 2020, it's always predict the outcome that causes the most chaos. Well, because it is a ladder. And yes, uh, you're right, that would be the most chaotic. And I mean, the, oh, here's the other thing we didn't ask is that, we talked about seats. I, I genuinely believe that the conservatives are going to have vastly more votes. I say vastly, not you know a landslide, but there will be a significant difference in votes between the conservatives and liberals, and the conservatives will be way out front. The problem they have is that their vote is very inefficient. They're going to win a lot of ridings by 25,000 votes, and they're gonna lose a lot of ridings by considerably less than that. Um, and so you'll see them you know, running up the score in places like Niagara and uh, Southern Alberta, but uh, the liberal vote is what we call efficient and that they, you know, a mile wide and an inch thick used to be the, uh, an inch deep used to be the old expression. And so that's why I do think that the, the liberals will end up with more seats, but the vote will not be pretty for them. Can you imagine, can you imagine if we had prop rep and you had suddenly like the, con the conservatives trying to work with the PPC and block to build a, enough uh, seats and the NDP liberals and green if there is a green, trying to work to block, like it would be unbelievable. So thank God we don't have prop rep. That's yes, all. I was gonna say I, I try not to imagine life under prop rep because uh, that that would be yes. I don't I don't. It, I've had this argument recently on Twitter as a last note is that if the PPC wins, you know, ten percent of the vote, uh, which would be high, but just because it's a nice round number, and don't win any seats, I don't think that. <laughs> That first past the post could come up with a better argument for itself. That's good. We don't want to reward things like that. I, I like big consensus-seeking parties. I don't like fringe and single issue and yes, regional parties, uh, having an incentive to narrow in and dig their heels. Uh, I just no. It's it, it's fascinating because Jordan in the the referendum here and in talk of electoral reform across the country, it is so often framed explicitly as a way to help left-wing parties, the NDP and Greens specifically. And it's amazing how often, how partisan their argument is. Um, and it's always you know, dismissed as, well, what if there's a right-wing fringe party? But well, pff, that will never happen. That's not, no, that's not how this works. Well, the PPC is what, like triple the Greens right now in the national polls. That's, yeah. if that doesn't wake you up, I don't know what will. Yeah, well, they've run a better campaign, so maybe they deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they deserve to be triple the greens. They've run three times the campaign the greens have. Well, we know what the hate mail will be this week. But I mean, they, they haven't tried, they haven't formed a circular firing squad around their own leader. So at that point, yes, I'm going to have to concede that one. Exactly. Like, I, I, I don't know. Like, what are you going to say? Like, they, you know, the PBC are such, they're such interesting cats, right? Like, so we're here in Surrey. Um, you've been, we've been led to believe over the past few years that the PBC are white supremacists. They're running, you know, second, third generation Indo-Canadian candidates here in Surrey. And you're like, how is this squaring up? And you're seeing their signs on lawns in neighborhoods where 
like you think life is pretty good in this neighborhood like really here um i see a lot of ppc signs around uh, greater victoria really? so many more than i would have expected see that just astonishes me yeah, I mean, I don't see them winning any seats here in Victoria, no. but it's, yeah, they'll attract enough of the vote that I, I, I this is what I wrote about last week. I, I think that we're going to be talking about, obviously next week we're going to be talking about who the prime minister is, but the other conversation that we're going to be having is, what, okay, the PPC are a thing, What? where do we go from here? And it's not a conversation I'm looking forward to having, but you're right. I mean, it's happening in, in front of our eyes. I, for me, the moment I dismissed them, I don't want to ramble too much about this, but I had kind of dismissed them until uh, there was that rally in Kelowna, which was huge. And also even just looking up how many candidates are running. I had no idea they're running. I think it's 312. It's yeah. pretty close to a full slate. They're about yep. 20, 25 short. That's, that's a lot of people. Yep. No, you're, you're exactly right. So something's happening. We'll also end up discussing a lot if for some reason the perception is they cost the Conservatives a government. Yes. Yeah. And we'll see. I suspect that the, the votes they bring in will be, it'll be more, yes, they will obviously, they'll pull a lot of votes from the Conservatives, but I think it's going to be more complicated than that. And this is not something we're going to learn in the next week. It's going to be months and that. And I suspect they're going to pull a lot of people that wouldn't otherwise have voted. And also, I bet that there's a fair amount of bleeding uh, over from the Greens there, which may not make sense if you are if you view the spectrum as a straight line. The spectrum is not a straight line. It is a circle. Mm -hmm. All right. There we go. All right. They got really wonky there at the end. I know. Probably... This is far too in-depth for the uh, kind of uh, dumb talk we usually do. So That's right. I mean, it's, we need, like, pipes and tweed jackets for next week. Mm -hmm. All right. Until next week, when we hopefully know who the next prime minister is, he's Jordan Bateman. I'm McLean Kay. This has been BC Poly Hot Stove.